States, is anybody commanded to do abortion? In the United States, is anybody commanded to do abortion? No. The answer is no. No place in the United States is anybody commanded to do abortion. How about China? <clears throat> See, for many, many years, if a woman got pregnant the second time, they were commanded to have an abortion. You cannot have a second baby. Now, if you're a Christian in China and you're carrying a second baby, what should you do? See, it's not an issue for us, but it's an issue for Chinese believers. And you get into some of these awkward spots, and it's actually a difficult spot. What happens when Scripture commands you to, or when Scripture has a command to support life, and your government commands you to do something different? I mean, a very tense thing these days, you've got a, a woman in our church who's a school nurse, and because she's a school nurse, she is under regulation by her uh, her license as a school nurse, that when uh, students come to her and say I'm transitioning from female to male, she is required by law to give them the injections, the puberty blockers and the uh, testosterone that are going to male, their hormones to help in that transition. She believes a professional nurse that that is a serious mistake. And I'm not a medical person who I've uh, investigated this a lot. She, but she's commanded by her job, her, her license as a nurse, and her job with the school system, she's important for the schools, that she must give those injections as a part of her job. That puts her in a really, really, really severe conundrum because professionally and scripturally, she thinks that's wrong. What's she going to do? See, and that's the kind of thing you can get yourself into that we're talking about here when you say Scripture is a final authority, which at that spot we must obey God rather than men. And those, those kinds of challenges are extremely difficult. But the principle we agree with is that government has authority in our lives, and to the limit of disobeying God, we should be supporting and obedient to the government authorities. He must uh, do things that we uh, feel good about. What are some other authorities in our lives besides government? Parents. Parents, yep. What else? Bosses. Bosses at work, yep. What else? Teachers. Uh huh. Pastors. Uh huh. All so, parents. <laughs> he wants you to, I've got two guys here who want to say it again. Say it really loud, David. Pastors, yeah. So I, I wrote elders because the biblical term is elder. Uh, in, in the Bible, the word pastor is never used for that authority in the church. Elder is. We call them pastors many times. Elders, wisdom is. And this stuff is plain old stupid. Uh, and the Holy Spirit has an authority. Remember, I had a good job in 1969, and the Holy Spirit said, go to the Philippines. Did that have an authority in my life? He did. He did. What goes up in this upper level, what goes up here, is a higher authority than all these legitimate authorities? Over here. God does. Specifically scripture, because the way God speaks to us, authoritatively and trustworthiness, is in Bible. And what we're saying is, this is why I say the Bible has final authority, not only authority. Because I believe Scripture shows that all of these have authority in our life. I, what time shall we finish this session? What does the Bible say? What does the Bible say about what time we should finish this session? Never! I love you! Yeah, alright, my favorite person, yeah. I'm counting for it. See, there's a lot of places where Scripture doesn't speak at all. We'll talk about that a little bit later. There are a lot of things the Bible does not address. Another thing of legitimate authority. Something that competing sort of stuff. But the Bible, what we're saying here is that these, as authoritative as they are, and I can put myself in there too, because I have an authority, I can never contradict what the Bible says and have it be right. And that comes to lots of different things. 
I, I'm just working with several situations right now on the pastoral side of my life where one or the other partners in a marriage have decided that they would, they would like to have sexual involvement other than with their spouse. Good or bad? But they really like it. See, and the issue here is authority of Scripture. And Scripture is very clear. What's, what's the, what was Matthew 19 that we talked about the other day? The picture in Scripture is Jesus quotes Genesis and applies his own time to it. One man, one woman, husband and wife for life. That's the biblical standard. That's the biblical standard. And what I would say is that anybody who seeks sexual activity or fantasizing outside of their marriage spouse is committing sin. And I would say on what authority? Yeah. So now the question is, and we talked just a little bit about last night, what happens when divorce happens? Does divorce happen? What I would say is divorce is always a result of sin. That doesn't mean that every divorced person has committed sin, but divorce is always the product of sin. Because they, the, the disobedience they had there. And my particular view, you know, I, can, I think I can defend it biblically, is divorce is always the product of sin, but it's not the unforgivable sin. Amen. And what happens in too many churches is divorce is the unforgivable sin. And that's what comes out of practice. And I just don't think that's what Scripture says. And again, that's a point of tension. So I mentioned Melissa last night, uh, who was thrown to the curb by her husband. Uh, she saw herself as a filthy sinner who may have been reinforced in some church experiences. I think those church transgress the authority of Scripture because our goal is to come in and shepherd people back to a place of wholeness. And what they did was they heaped shame and guilt on her and really hurt her as a person. So that's the other scriptural authority. Now there's lots of lots of disagreement on this, but that's where it's coming out in the point of authority in scripture. Would you still call it bad if um when the divorce is divorced? Say it a little bit louder. Would you call it bad if you can divorce is more like abusive? I abusive my argument. Okay, Gary has opinions on everything. <laughs> Occasionally, Gary is right, so I'm speaking for myself. I, it seems to me that there are many things that kill a marriage. And a marriage is that one flesh, that soul connection that happens between a husband and a wife that Sharon had been enjoying for more than 50 years. There's a partnership in life, and lots of things will kill that bond. And part of what kills that bond can be an ongoing pattern of abuse in a marriage. It kills the trust relationship, it kills the connection, and that abuse can actually kill a marriage. So if there really isn't any marriage left, it's dying. And divorce, in my judgment, is the recognition that that marriage is dead and people are hurting each other. So my answer to me would say, yes, an ongoing pattern of abuse can lead to the death of a marriage and divorce will come out of it. Is that going to answer your question? What else do you want to ask? <laughs> Gary has very strong opinions on that. It's my job as an elder in my church to protect women or men in my church who are being abused in marriage. Amen. I feel very strongly about that. And one of the, I've helped women, I, I've helped men, I've never helped a man, I've helped women leave the home to a position of safety in abusive context. And I will do that, and I believe I'm doing the work of God when I do that. Amen. Yes. But, there's one more thing I want to do. I want to take that abusive husband, I want to take him out behind the barn and beat the crap out of him. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know what it feels like. Yeah. And uh, I, I, I guess I'll protect the wife who's being abused, but I'm going to have a chat with that husband. You bet I am. If I can possibly pull it off. Because he's a, he, I, there's all kinds of reasons people do things. 
and I'm, I'm actually going to talk to him before I beat him up, but I will try to beat him up. <laughs> I've never actually done it, but I want to. I want to. Uh, because my job is to bring people back toward a position of trust. You're a thoughtful young man. Good for you. Yeah, we're going to have a lot more questions. How long should this session go on? Knowing that they've been assaulting us with the brisket smell over there. Is it is it legal for them to assault us with brisket smell no. all morning long? I don't think so either. It's not cool. It's not cool. Yeah, well, it's I think it's legal. By the way, who did that huckleberry blueberry jam that was on the tables? Oh, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. That was marvelous. Oh man, that was so good. Yeah. And did you do the elderberry too? Yes. Hey, you're my favorite person. I love you. <laughs> yeah. oh, that was so good. Okay, now we talked about this last night, so I'm just going to leave it at this. I, it seems to me, this is First Thessalonians 5, don't quench the Spirit, don't despise prophecies. I think the Holy Spirit speaks today. Amen. I think it can, that's the point that good and godly people disagree. There are people, on our faculty at Western, there are people who think that God stopped speaking when Scripture was finished. And that we, we live by Scripture and wisdom only. And that's part of that Scripture only. Type. I'm of the opinion, with many others, that God continues to speak, but there is no such thing as untestable prophecy. You test everything. And there's a whole lot of abuse that comes out of people claiming God's authority for their own statement. So you've got to test to be sure it comes from God. But I do think God gives us information today, and then we hold fast to that. Okay. Second, I want to talk about this chain of authority. And this is the triune God has authority over all because he alone created the universe. That's a, that's a very, very key question. And what we're talking about here, when we talk about authority of scripture, the primary authority of scripture is to tell us who is this God. When we think about authority of scripture, a primary area is who is God? What is he like? How many gods are there? That's a trick question. That's a trick question. If I come back and look at scripture, in, let's see, if I go back to Exodus chapter 20, what's happened in Exodus chapter 20? That's the Ten Commandments. And what it says here, and God, what's the Hebrew word here? Elohim. Elohim. And Elohim spoke all these words saying, I am, when you see four capital letters, what is that? That's Yahweh, the personal name of God. So I am professor. That would be my, that would be my title. And I'm Gary is a personal name. I'm Bershears, but there are more than one Bershears around, which is really a problem for David because he's Bershears around here and I'm messing things up. So I am Yahweh, your what? Elohim. And down here, you shall have no other what? Elohim. The word here and here is identical. It's exactly the same word in Hebrew. And Elohim spoke, you shall have another Elohim before you. I am Yahweh, and then your is a preposition, goes on the end, so it's Elohim over here. That's a form of Elohim. So we can say Elohim, Elohim, Elohim. What are these Elohim? False gods. Those are spiritual beings, angel level beings, like Michael and Gabriel. And they're Elohim, they're spirit beings. And Elohim said, I am Yahweh, your Elohim, you shall have another Elohim before you. What are some of those other Elohim? Well, let me show you some of them. Uh, one of the crazy stories, 1 Kings 11, 
Solomon. Good guy or bad guy? Yeah. Cracked foundation from the beginning. Cracked foundation from the beginning. A lot of good stuff, but the cracks got wider as he got older. He loved many foreign women that were pulling all these kinds of folk, including the daughter of Pharaoh, his first wife. From the nations to the Lord said to the Israel, You shall not enter into marriage though with them. Nearest shall be with you, for surely they will turn your hearts after their what? Elohim. So, uh, let's see what we find here. He had how many wives? Seven. This guy's supposed to be wise? <laughs> and in case of that was enough, he had three hundred concubines. So he's got a thousand women in his life. Go figure. And his life led him straight. So Solomon grew old. His heart turned after other what? Elohim. His heart was not fully devoted to God as his father Abraham. So he followed Astor, the, the Elohim of Sidonians. Okay? If I'm looking for some Sidonians today, where would I go? If I'm looking for some Sidonians today, where would I go? Not Portland. <laughs> And there might be some Sidonians, but that's not that home country. There's probably everything in Portland, you're right. Where would you go? Nope. Oh, they're around today. They're not in Palestine. Where are they? 30 miles south of Beirut, Lebanon. 30 miles south of Beirut, Lebanon is what? Sidon. Remember Tyre and Sidon? Sidon is a port city. It's 30 miles south of Beirut. A month from now, straight out of the end, Beirut got going. I don't know if we're down to Sidon. We're pretty busy there in Beirut. That's Sidon. It's a port city. And what it's saying here is this tribe in this region of Sidon has a god associated with it named Astor. What is this god? It's a powerful spiritual being who has authority over that city. Not godly authority. Ungodly authority. If I'm looking for Ammonites today, where would I go? Jordan. Jordan. What's the name of the town today? Amman, Jordan. If you look at a pre-1917 map for the Balfour Declaration, you see a region of Ammon. There's a region there. And who's the god of the Ammonites? Moloch. An Elohim. Now what is that Elohim? It's a, what's the highest level ungodly Elohim? What's the highest level ungodly Elohim? See, the devil, the serpent. He's the head dude on the dark side. Who's the head dude on the light side? Not Christ. He's, he's above all that. He's a God guy. At the angel level, Michael. 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 And that's why in Revelation 12, Revelation 12, it talks here about this war broken in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon and his angels. And who's the dragon? Well, he's the devil or Satan. So here's Satan and his angels or his gods. Michael and his angels or his gods. So Elohim is just a name for a powerful spiritual being. And there are a lot of them. Who is our Elohim? Yeah. Yahweh. And what do, we know, what do we know about Yahweh? So this is biblical authority. What is the character of our Yahweh? Of our, of our Elohim, Yahweh? And there is a, there's a verse in the Bible. Uh, what's, what's the most, what is the most favorite verse in the entire Bible for y'all? John 3.16, which says what? Kudos. Yeah. <laughs> What's the John? Now, the Bible quotes itself all the time. What's the John 3.16 in the Bible? Exodus 34, 5 and 6. Almost. 6 and 7. Mm -hmm. Acts 34, 6. Yeah, you did one verse. That's better than, far better than most. 
This is the cleft of the rock passage. And this gives us the characteristics, fundamental characteristics of our, of our God. God. What's the first thing it says about him? Well, the first thing it says he has a name. Yeah. So if he has a name, it means he's a person who wants to relate. But what are the characteristics? What's the first thing? Compassion. Compassion. Compassion toward whom? If you look back in Exodus chapter 32, you've got the golden calf thing. He is compassionate toward golden calf worshippers. This Hebrew word here is the word Ruham. And the word Ruham uh, is the word that in a different form would be for a mother's womb. Ruham is the word for a womb. What does a, what does a woman do with her womb? That's where she nurtures babies before they're born. And the picture here is the Yahweh's attitude toward us is like a mother toward that baby forming in her womb and toward that baby after it grows. That's the first characteristic of our God. He is compassionate or merciful toward us. That's the first characteristic of God. Now, to me, that is incredibly important, and it comes with biblical authority. Because the character of our God is the most important question we have. And the very first thing it says about him, and this, the most quoted verse in the Bible by the Bible, is that he is merciful or compassionate. For whom? For golden calf worship. Compassion. And see, to me, when I listen to people preaching about God, and I listen to them a lot, is I want to know what they say the first thing about God is. And I hear lots of different things. And that's really important. See, when I think about it, I think of God who is compassionate for broken, sinful, angry people. What's his goal? To bring them back into order and flourish. See, and part of the reason, see, I kicked out of Christian, I was raised a Christian. You know, there's just no doubt about it. I was raised a Christian. I always believed in God. I always believed in Jesus. And at age 14, as a precocious, arrogant sophomore in high school, I was studying geometry. Loved it. Loved it. And in that geometry class, I came across the verse I just had up here in 1 Thessalonians 5 thing. Except I had it in King James that said, prove all things, old past such was all good. I said, I like that. I love proving things in geometry. So I went to the guys in my church and said, how do you know the Bible's word of God? How do you know Jesus is God? And by the way, how do you know there is a God? What am I doing? Prove all things, old past that which is good. Now, to be sure, I did it with a pretty major chip on my shoulder. Arrogant jerk of a kid. But I was serious what I was doing. And what I was told in effect by the people in that church is nice Christian boys don't ask questions like that. And I said, well, I am asking something like that. That means I'm not a nice Christian boy and I'm out of here. And I kicked off Christianity and for the next four and a half years I lived to say I, I was an I was an anti-Christian. I was doing negative evangelism among Christians. I was talking them out of their faith quite successfully. It was a... And then what I was doing is looking for a better God in my life. And where I ended up, looking for what today I would call a worldview, to give me what is the ultimate good, what's the ultimate reality, those worldview questions, I ended up with Ayn Rand, Atlas Shrugged, uh, Who is John Galt, Virtue of Selfishness. Uh, and what she said is basically what I showed you back in Genesis chapter 3. Your own authority, you figure out what to do, depend on yourself, don't depend on anybody else. Altruism is not only stupid, but sinful. And I bought into that big time. And what I did, in effect, is I made myself God. And I discovered pretty quickly I wouldn't have to the job. 
and I was in despair. I was headed towards suicide as a sophomore in college four years later. And I don't know what would have happened because I'm so intense. I don't think it would have survived. And what happened in that case, uh, we changed pastors in our church, a woman named Kathy Thompson. One year younger than I was, and the first person I'd seen who was both intelligent and a consistent Jesus follower. Uh, Kathy Cole now lives down in the Medford area. She's married to another Gary. Uh, and what she did was bring back into my life. She, I, she listened to my question instead of going eek and running away, like most others had done. She engaged and her dad, Dick Thompson, turned me on to C.S. Lewis. And in effect, what happened was, I said, I need to go back and look at the foundational documents. And I went back to the Gospels, which I'd never really been taught, because we were in a doctrine church, and I was taught, we were taught from Paul. And the Gospels were just as moral stories. What I did is I went back and read the story of Jesus. And what I found taught there was a picture of a God who is compassionate enough that this God led all glory. This God has everything going for him. He leaves behind the glory and does what? Comes to earth. In what way does he come to earth? How, when when the, uh, Zeus or Apollo come to earth in Greek mythology, how does Zeus or Apollo come to earth? They come with power, get in a fight, get in a drunken ball, kill some people, rape some women, go back to heaven. That's the common story of how God's come to earth. How does Yahweh come to earth? A little baby. Who met him when he came to earth? Who met him when he came to earth? Shepherds. Okay, now what's the status of shepherds? They're scum. Sheep stink. Shepherds hang with sheep, therefore shepherds stink. Who wants a shepherd in your house? Nobody. Why didn't the kings and priests come to meet God when he came to earth? Study insult. So the first thing Jesus faces is insult. This is the God of the universe chooses to go and be insulted. When he leaves Bethlehem, where does he go? Egypt. Why? Why did he go to Egypt? Because the king was going to kill him. So he went to Egypt. What does that make him? A refugee. A refugee. Think of Syrian refugees today living in exile under extremely hostile circumstances, say in Germany, <coughs> which is relatively friendly among the European countries. But they're refugees. Saeed is a student of mine from Beirut who's living in Germany right now. They're in intense persecution. They do not want him there. Jesus went to Egypt and lived as a refugee. Who is Jesus? He is Yahweh, King of the Universe, living as a refugee. He comes back to Nazareth. What kind of life does he have in Nazareth? Extreme poverty. This is the God of the universe in extreme poverty. When Jesus goes to playground to play with the boys, what kind of reception he gets from the other boys? Hey Jesus, where's your daddy? What do you call that? Bullying. This is the God of the universe who begins as a studied insult. This is a political refugee, comes back to Nazareth, lives under excruciating poverty, and lives as a bullied. And then he goes to Jerusalem. How does it work out? Not so good. After a little while, the high priest sends his soldiers to arrest Jesus. They successfully arrest him and they take him to a back room. And the high priest tells the soldiers, get him. What do soldiers do to another man when the boss says, get him? 
Did Jesus go through all kinds of abuse? This is the king of the universe. And he went to a cross. So we're saying here, and this is with scriptural authority, this is our God. Why am I a passionate Jesus follower today? Because that God is one that I say, oh my gosh. And he says, come and serve with me. That's why I'm a Jesus follower. Because that picture of a God who will humble himself to that level out of compassion and grace, love and faithfulness, he is out to forgive wickedness. He does not leave the guilty unpunished. Those who refuse his forgiveness will live in their sin. That's the picture of God. And so when I speak with scriptural authority, that's the number one thing I do. As I say, who is this God? And that's who he is. And because that's the character, I compare him with other gods. And I do it. If you look at, I mean, look whatever religion you want there, take Hinduism. What's the character of the gods in Hinduism? Nothing like this. Nothing like this. Nothing like this. And see, what I'm saying here by scriptural authority, and this is the number one place of scriptural authority, this is who God is. And the good news is this is the character of our God. He wants to bring forgiveness, honor, protection to people. And that's why I'm Jesus Paul. Let me just run through just a little bit more here in this character of our God. If I go back to Exodus chapter 14. Well, let's go back to Exodus. Well, let's just do this. I, we're Bible nerds. In the book of Exodus, where is Israel living? Egypt. What sort of status there? Slaves. 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 Uh, and what are they doing in slavery? They're being exterminated. Genocide is what Pharaoh was doing to the people of Egypt. First by working them to death, and it didn't work out, then by killing the male babies. What happens when you kill all the male babies? The race dies out. What do you do with the female beings? Take them as sex slaves into your thing. That's what Pharaoh was doing. That's what Egyptians were doing to Egypt. And they cry out to God. God sends Moses, and then he sends them. He takes them out into the desert, in the desert. And what does he do? Remember the story? They leave Egypt, and they come out, and here's the, the Red Sea in front of them. What's behind them? The Egyptians. Pharaoh's army. What's the next expectation for them? Death. They're going to be either drowned or slaughtered. Ay, 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 ay. And what does God tell Moses to do? Stretch out your staff, which he does, and what happens? The waters part. What happens to the nation of Israel? They cross. They walk through on dry ground. They get to this side, and here comes Pharaoh and his armies. What happens? The ocean closes in, and Pharaoh's armies are destroyed. What's the character of God at that spot? What is the character of God in Exodus chapter 14? In Exodus 14... We see the God who, in relation to his people, is protecting. You see me saying that. What God does is he protects his people. From whom? From the most powerful nation in the world who's out to kill them. Our God is the one who protects. They get to Exodus chapter 15, and what do the people do? They sing an incredible worship song to Yahweh. Okay, good thing. And the whole chapter is about this. Moses leads and then Miriam leads. So 
So Moses and Miriam both lead the people of Israel in this incredible worship song. It's amazing. Chapter 16. Now, just a few days later, they set out across the desert of Sin, not Sin. In the 15th, second day, they came out. The whole community did what? Grumbled. Grumbled. If only it died by the Lord's hand in Egypt, they would start on pots of meat and all the foods we wanted, but by you, brother, says it, and we're going to starve here in the desert. Oh, yeah, yeah. Now, they had pots of meat and ate all they want there in Egypt, right? No, their Pharaoh's trying to kill them. These people, just a few days earlier, had been seeing praise to Yahweh for delivering from Pharaoh. And what are they doing now? Whining. Complaining. Bitterly. They're insulting God. What does God do in response to their insult? I will rain down bread from heaven. You got each day to gather it. What is God doing here? He is providing. I heard somebody say that is exactly right. Exodus chapter 16, he is providing. What is he providing? Bread and quail. It turns out a little bit later. There's a lot more I can say. It's an amazing kind of thing. Exodus chapter 17. So God responds to their insults. They're fighting quail and bread. They keep going. And what's happening here? There's no water. What do they do? They quarrel with Moses. The people are thirsty for water. And they what? Grumbled. Moses comes to God. What am I going to do with these people? I get that. <laughs> what does Yahweh respond? What does Yahweh respond? Strike the rock. So he did. And what happened? There comes water. Water poured out. God is providing. God is providing again. Exodus 17. All right, 17. is providing now water along with the quail and bread. But it's not done yet. Verse 8. What happens? Malachites came and attacked Israelites. Now what's the comparison of these two armies? The Malachites and the Israelites. What has Israel been doing for the last 400 years? Slavery. Slavery in Egypt. What kind of weapons do they bring with them out of the desert? Nothing. None. What kind of political power do they have? None. How well are their soldiers trained? None. None at all. How about the Amalekites? Bread for war. Super powerful warring tribe. Think of ISIS. It would be a similar kind of thing. Absolutely ruthless soldiers with great power and support. And now the Amalekites are attacking the Israelites. What's the expectation? Bloodbath. 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 What does God say? Choose our guys and go out and fight the Amalekites. Now, you're one of the guys who's been chosen. What's your expectation? Glory, <coughs> this is not going to be good. But he says what? I'll take this staff that turned to a serpent brought blood, turned the Nile into blood, split the Red Sea, and I will stand with the staff of God in my hands. So Joshua fought the Malachites. As Moses had ordered, he went to the top of the hill. As long as Moses held his hands, the Israelites would what? Win. How did they do that? Power of God. Power of God. But whenever he lowered his hands, the Malachites were winning. So you get this crazy thing as they, Aaron and Hur stood and hold up his hands. Interesting picture. And Joshua, what? Or came the Amalekites with the sword. Now, 
What is he doing here? He is protecting. And then you see something really interesting in verse 14. What does he say in verse 14? He says, write the Bible. This is the first place in Scripture where it says, write the Bible. And what's he supposed to write down? Write it down so people will remember who is our God. Write this in the scroll as something to be remembered. And make sure Joshua hears it because I will completely blot out the name of Amalek under heaven. What's he saying? I will continue to protect you. What's the purpose of the Bible? Number one purpose of the Bible is what? It teaches the character of our God. And what's the character of our God? Genesis 1. What's the character of our God? Creator who blesses. Exodus 14. What's the character of our God? Protects. From whom? Redeems us from Egypt. Redeems us from the place of the evil. Chapter 15, what is the character? Chapter 16, what's the character of our God? Provides for our needs. Chapter 17, what's the character of our God? Protects us from our enemies. The purpose of the Bible, the authority of the Bible, is it teaches the character of our God. And that, of course, comes to fruition in the story of Jesus. Because Jesus is the, is the same creator of God leaves all the glory of heaven to come down here to be insulted, forced to live as a refugee, bullied, extreme poverty, political oppression, every form of abuse, and then dies on the cross. A cruel and horrible death. Why? So we can come back into fullness and flourishing and fulfillment in our purpose. That's the gospel. That's the good news. That's why we serve Jesus today. It's not so I can be better than somebody else. It's not to tell somebody else, you're going to hell. It's not the guilt and shame somebody else. It's actually bringing forgiveness and healing God to that place. Of those people who have been through whatever kind of junk it is. To say, there's a purpose for your life. And it's incredibly fulfilling. But it may be really hard because you're going to fall away with Jesus. Just gospel. I know there are some of you here who aren't yet followers of Jesus. And what I'd like to ask you to do is consider which God you're serving. I'd like to ask you to think about that. Because there are different gods. There's Moloch and there's Kamish and there's Astarte. There's Aphrodite, who's a great god today. What is, the God, what is the God Aphrodite? She's the God of sex. And our society serves sex as a great God. And thrilling as sex can be, it will not bear the burden of being God. It will not. To make sex God, it will always disappoint. Many are serving the great God of narcissists. What's the point of the great God of narcissists? So, the voice of the dragon. And I can say from my own experience, you're not up to the job. And what I'm saying to any of you who are not followers of Jesus here, there's a better way. This way of following Yahweh, Yeshua, the Lord Jesus, who left all the glory of heaven to bring the character of God to us, who's compassionate, gracious, slow to anger, loving, faithful, forgiving, and just. He calls us to be with him to be ordered in society that's nurturing and flourishing, protecting and redeeming. That's what we call today. That's the authority of Scripture right there. Is that good news? And I call you to consider who Jesus is and be considered, is he worthy of your life? I can say from my own perspective, yeah, he is. Because I've been on the other side of that thing. And I know that the great God sex, which I never worshipped, the great God self, which I worship deeply, the great God power, which I have dabbled in, but all is the historic God there. 
those gods will not satisfy. They will always give. Because they're in for themselves. Yahweh is the only giving God. So, is that a gospel invitation? You bet it is. Is it worthy of following with your entire life? You bet it is. And I can say as an old man, hard as it's been at times, I've seen people released from demons, I've seen people released from guilt and shame and fear through the power of this great God, Yahweh. So, we're going to quit there because it's a great God grist it. Commanding <laughs> <laughs> our obedience and exaltation here. But I want to pray for you before you go. Can you do that? Great God. <laughs> Try and God Yahweh, thank you for who you are. Thank you that you have shown yourself to us in your actions and in your those things written down in the Bible, those who have followed the command you gave to Moses and written down these stories and the accounts of who you are. And Yahweh, I pray for those who are here who are not yet following you, that you will touch their lives with that reality. Holy Spirit, will you open the eyes of hearts? And Lord, for those of us who are still learning more and more what it means to follow you, but we've made that commitment, Holy Spirit, will you examine my heart? Will you know me, search me, know me, Lord, know my heart, show any wicked way that's there, leave me in a way everlasting that I can be done with the remaining wickedness that's still a part of who I am. Thank you, Yahweh, that you are compassionate woman from a nursing baby, that you're gracious, that you help even enemies. And yes, you do get angry because sin makes you angry, abuse and makes you really angry. But that you're loving and faithful and that your deepest desire is to forgive and restore. But you do not leave the guilty unpunished. You're always the God of justice. Thank you for who you are. Teach us more deeply what it means to follow you and live your life in the community. And I pray blessing on this community of Stanfield Baptist and guests. That this will always be a community where you're honored in life and in joyful testimony. As we head off now to enjoy some brisket and some good time together at lunch and this afternoon, we pray that you'll be blessed in all we do. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.